Sunny is a digital writing assistant that helps you save your time. Should I start? Welcome everyone to our 39 webinar in this series, but today's webinar is not based on plant science, it's quite based on our development on ethics. It not only give us, make us better person, but it also gave us a better scientist in this field. I'm very happy today we have Shubhas Chandra Lakatiya, Professor Shubhas Chandra Lakatiya from BHU. He has a great experience in the research and he's a great speaker and knowledge in this subject. And he is a very, uh, very uh, generous and it gives so many uh, inputs. It can help us to understand the ethics because we have a lot of ethical questions and sometimes it's not. Uh, found in any books or Google. So it, ethics is a very much personal and uh, uh, specific related to subjects. And he is a, uh, I, uh, in my choice, he is a, one of the great speaker on that particular subject. I request Soma, a little bit introduce Bioengine and a today's speaker. I will collect the questions from the YouTube live chat and ask our speaker after the interview session. And we already collected a few questions internationally on the ethics. We are going to shortlist it and ask during the question answer round. Everybody should get the feedback link as soon as they submit their registration form. And I also emailed 18,000 plus, 1800 plus participants this uh, feedback link. I will give the password for certificate application during the question answer round. Thanks, and Shoma, I request you to introduce Bharanji. Welcome to Bioengine, a platform from which plant scientists can present their research to the world and future scientists can gain knowledge, perspective, and inspiration. Thank you for joining us in this very special webinar. As more people are joining in, let me start with some housekeeping information. Please note that after attending today's talk, you can apply for a certificate of participation. For this, you need to submit the feedback form that you received after registration. You need to enter a password in the feedback form that will be provided multiple times in the YouTube chat after the presentation. When you fill out the feedback form, please remember to mention the full name of your institute and the full institute address. You can collect your participation certificates after two to three days from our website. BioEngine does not send certificates through email. An integral part of BioEngine is the BioEngine Plant Science Journal. It is a peer-reviewed, open-access, international online journal. We encourage students and scholars to submit your articles as we seek to publish papers that are relevant in the field of plant science research. Selection of manuscripts for publication will be based on novel research, original data, synthesis or concepts without plagiarism and violation of any copyright. We welcome submissions from all fields of plant sciences, including agriculture. Please visit the journal section on our website to know more. You may also send your published posters to be displayed on the poster gallery of our website. Please visit our website to register for upcoming webinars. Connect with BioEngine via Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So the topic for today's webinar is ethics in research and publication. We are highly honored to have our guest speaker, Professor Lakhotia with us. Professor S.C. Lakhotia, mm -hmm. currently a BHU Distinguished Professor and SCRB Distinguished Fellow at the Department of Zoology, Banaras Hindu University, is engaged for nearly 55 years in, in studying diverse aspects of gene expression using the Drosophila model system. Nearly all of his research work has been carried out in India. His recent contributions to Ayurvedic biology using the fly model 
have provided a new stimulus to unbiased proactive research using contemporary understanding of biological and material sciences for revival of Ayurveda and its integration with the contemporary healthcare system. He has written many articles and organized discussion meetings on issues related to quality higher education, research publications, and assessment in the country. Professor Lakotia, leading by personal example, is a strong votary of promoting publication of high quality research journals in India. A large number of undergraduate, postgraduate, and doctoral students trained by him, irrespective of gender, caste, or creed, are successfully pursuing their chosen careers. In recognition of his contributions in research and education, he has received many awards and recognitions, including fellowships of all the three science academies in India, the INSA Young Scientist Medal, the SS Bhatnagar Prize, the UGC Career Award, <clears throat> UGC JC Bose Medal, INSA Aryabhata Medal, the International Association for the Study of Tra Traditional Asian Medicine or ISTAM, Zandu International Oration for Excellence in Research Contributions for Ayurvedic and Natural Products. He is on the editorial board of journals like J Biosciences, Cell Stress and Chaperones, RNA Biology, Annals of Neurosciences, to name a few. He served 2014 to 2018 as Editor-in-Chief of the Proceedings of Indian National Science Academy. We are really lucky and highly honored to have this opportunity to learn from him about ethics. I now request Professor Lakotia to please take this virtual platform. Sir, over to you. Thank you, uh, Shubhadeep and Soma for uh, organizing this meeting and for uh, giving uh, introduction to, uh, to me, uh, both sides. I mean, I, I got to know the community that you are dealing with. It's a great thing that you are doing. And uh, I'll, I'll just start sharing my screen and then begin the talk. Sure. Okay, uh, I hope my... Uh, yeah. That's the beginning I start with. And, and uh, I'm so happy that this talk had been arranged on this great day that we celebrate here as Teacher's Day in, uh, initially by circular allocation. And one of the things that I like, uh, which I personally really appreciate is what he stated. Uh, he, has met, he has made many, many statements. Like one is, when we think we know, we cease to learn. Uh, I, I also put it differently that when we know something, what we know is what we still do not know. Because only knowing it, we can move forward and find out what we do not know. And that's what I think the basic of research is. So I'll talk about that part. And then uh, Sarva Radhakrishnan, uh, I'm sure everybody know that. But one thing great for me is that he was one of the early vice chancellors of Banarasan University and uh, made a great contribution in shaping this university what it is. After Mal Malviaji's term was over, he, he took over and served for almost 10 years. And then of course he rose to become vice president of India and president of India. But all than that, he was a great philosopher, a great teacher. And, and you know, his commitment to teaching was that while he was vice chancellor of Banas University, he was still a full professor at Calcutta University and at Oxford University. Very unique thing. Now, I, I, I'll just read out some statements, some, some uh, random statements from his writings. Uh, which uh, lets us know what he thinks about education. Okay, just wait a minute. Uh, like what he said, what education according to the Indian tradition is not merely a means of earning a living. It is initiation into the life of spirit, a training of human soul in the pursuit of truth and the practice of virtue. Another point, all education is on one side a search for truth, on the other side, it is pursuit of social betterment. Education should give the children not only intellectual stimulation, but a purpose. And, and I think this is very important for all of us to remember in current times, particularly. And any satisfactory system of education should insist on both knowledge and wisdom, jnana, vijnana, sahitam. It should not only train the intellect, 
but bring grace into the heart of man. And this is where ethics becomes very important. Other thing that I would like to uh, quote is from a, a great uh, Iranian scholar who had visited India in uh, 2017. Uh, he was uh, in the uh, present day Afghanistan and, and a great uh, scientist, had a very good knowledge of physics, astrology, and, but, and, and many, many languages. And when he came to India, he looked at Indian science and actually his book on the, this Tariq e Pin is, has become a great history for uh, medieval India. And that's a great source. But something that he said in the current context is, what is the value of science and knowledge? The stubborn critic would say, what is the benefit of these sciences? He does not know the virtue that distinguishes mankind from all the animals. It is knowledge in general, which is pursued and, and which is pursued for the sake of knowledge itself, because its acquisition is truly delightful and is unlike the pleasure, this, uh, the, desirable from other pursuits, but the good cannot be brought forth and evil cannot be avoided except by knowledge. And this is where I think uh, all of us who are in the academic field must remember and must practice. The first question that we can ask is what is research? Now, this is something that if you look at the mankind's history and mankind's so the social evolution, ability to wonder, especially the ability to wonder at their ability to wonder is a unique feature of mankind. Every living organism has curiosity, has ways to find out what is in the nature, gather information from nature, or whatever we call it, that's ultimately becomes knowledge. But humans have a unique thing that we can even question, how do we think about, how do we wonder, how do we analyze, how do we interpret? I, I don't think any other animal, any other uh, plant or bacteria or viruses have this capacity, and, and that's a unique feature that man has. And this was added much more by once we evolved spoken and written languages, that's what has become uh, the in, uh, instrumental progress of civilization because now what we can know today is what our ancestors learned because they can pass, pass on the information through spoken and written languages, which no other uh, system has uh, in, in all other uh, uh, animal groups or others at the most, the, the knowledge gained in one's lifetime can be passed on to the next generation. They have some parental care, but humans, it can go beyond generations and beyond centuries. And, and that's what makes our uh, base for research always wider and wider. And so research is basically at the root of research is curiosity and self driven efforts. One way to understand research and curiosity is just look at a six to 12 month old toddler who is just uh, crawling uh, on the ground and uh, anywhere and wants to know everything, wants to understand everything, wants to feel, touch, and see everything. That's curiosity. And I think that curiosity is what makes a researcher. And it involves systematic and creative investigation in any domain of knowledge, which can be philosophical, materialistic issues, or anything in this universe that can be perceived by our senses. We have five senses, and uh, anything that we can perceive by this can be subject matter of our research. An important point to understand is that research creates new knowledge, which has honors the person who found something new and recipients, the uh, society in general, the specific readers and so on, who read, who learn about that new finding. And so they are recipients. And, and obviously, as I said, the, the growth of human isolation has been and continues to be dependent upon research. Now, ethics, moral values, and law, they, their meaning and their connotations can vary in different contexts, societies, cultures, and nations. It's very difficult to give one single definition to any one of them. But in general, what we say is ethics is a system of accepted beliefs that control behavior. Now, these, as I, as I said before, these are society, cultural value dependent, but, but they remain for that particular group uh, kind of accepted beliefs and uh, what should be done, what should not be done. Morality is again overlaps with this, but these are principles that define what is good and bad or right and wrong behavior. Again, good and bad will always argue can be very relative, but a given society accepts something as good, something as bad, and that's what uh, uh, doing something against what is considered uh, good is wrong behavior, what is considered uh, what, what is not to do a bad thing, maybe right thing or what follow a good thing is, is the right behavior. Law, on the other hand, 
can be oral or written. It regulates expected social conduct in public space and involves punishment for violation. That's where law differs from ethics and morality. One is expected to follow ethical and moral behaviors, but one is required to follow laws. That's uh, one way that we can differentiate between uh, what we call as ethics, moral values, and law, uh, these three things. Now, why do we need ethics? Why human behavior should worry about ethics? It is the most prime factor for sustainability of civilizations in the background of finite resources. Everywhere we are resource are limited, and therefore, uh, we, we develop certain ethical behavior, ethical principles, so that every member of the, of the society can participate and benefit equally. And developments in science and technology promote the forward development in societies, and therefore, ethics become connected to what we do because our societies will develop as what kind of ethics we follow. And uh, on the other hand, society will develop depending on what developments in science and technology happen. And, and Therefore, ethics and values become critical for sustainable development. In the same context, today when we talk of poor quality of education research, it's primarily due to erosion of ethical values in society in general and in education and research in particular. And that's where, where we need to be more sensitive, we, we need to be more concerned and understand what ethics in academic field says. Partly in the academic area, this has happened because of unhealthy competition due to ever increasing population and the lure of quick material gains that has tarnished the conventional image of teachers and researchers because teachers and researchers are expected with role models to work not only for self-satisfaction, but more for general benefits to the society. And that's why ethics are very critical. Ethics is important because search is search is search for the truth. And if we don't search the truth with an ethical way, we can never reach the truth. Scope and in, in research, particularly when we talk in uh, science research, the scope and depth of research are increasing exponentially. And in academic areas, research activity has become highly competitive because research output in academia are taken as a measure of individual's accomplishments for career prospects, recognition, etc. And at the same time, Translational or applied research has material benefits as well, and that's what makes more people attracted to participate in research. But we must remember, human values also follow the laws of thermodynamics. That is, everything tends to grow, uh, uh, get to entropy unless external energy is provided there or something. So accordingly, human nature also tends to indulge in selfish activities, which will increase social entropy, and this ultimately results in loss of integrity and honesty. And that's where we need this kind of inputs to uh, which I take as uh, energy to ensure that uh, our nature doesn't go to the base level. We, we follow a certain high level of ethics and keep the society intact. In, in research, it has evolved its own set of conduct rules to safeguard against unwarranted behaviors of researchers because uh, the, uh, about these points, uh, induce researchers to get into the wrong way. And that's where own a set of conduct rules, uh, although they are called rules, but they're kind of recommendations. But then now that uh, the, once the recommendations are blatantly violated, then that's where comes the rules and regulations. Uh, the important point to follow these conduct rules is to avoid a cascading negative impact on profession and on society, because if I discover something based on a wrong method or wrong approach or uh, uh, doing something uh, unwarranted, next person who follows my result will, will suffer. And that's where the impact becomes cascading. Now, integrity and honesty are the base of research. One is it's honest search for truth. It's trust. Now, this is something we, we need to understand. For example, when, when I read a book or when I read a, a, a published paper, I, I do not know the person who had done it, but I take it uh, uh, as a trust that what is stated in that by that person or by that group is true. And, and this is what you call that we have trust in others. And, and this is the base of research that unless you have trust, yes, you can verify, you can modify it, and then you can uh, suggest something was wrong. But then basically you have to have trust in whatever is published independence from outside control or influence. I do something because I believe in it, not because 
uh, someone says you do this and therefore I do this or you find this discovery and you make this discovery. No, it's independence. Justice and fairness, being just, uninfluenced, fair and reasonable. Objectivity, again, similar thing in a different context slightly, that it's uh, what I do is not because of my personal feeling or opinion. My personal feeling and opinion may be there, but if I, when I see the results, if I have to change that opinion, I should objectively change that. That's one of the important points in research. Openness, frank, communicative, and straightforward, not disguised. We do not follow legal language were very difficult. In scientific research, our language has to be frank and communicative, straightforward. Originality, independent and creative thinking to generate new knowledge. That's where original research moves. Respect for feeling or right of others. Dissent, while we, we respect the right and feeling of others, but we also have the uh, responsibility to express disagreement with a widely held view, but with due respect, not uh, in an insulting way. And tolerance, Abil and same way, if others criticize person uh, like me, I should take it objectively, I should have tolerance to take that criticism in an honest manner. Basic requirements for maintaining, these are again some basic points that have come about, reliability, integrity, and objectivity, accuracy and transparency, respect for intellectual property that somebody else had discovered and it's available in public domain, doesn't mean that it's, uh, I claim my ownership on, on that uh, property, which you call as intellectual property, because it is outcome of intellectual activity of some human brain. Responsible publication and mentoring. This I'll talk about how do we talk to go about responsible publication. Protection of subjects of research, human rights, animal rights, environmental rights. We have precise rules and regulations. Each country, nation has rules about this. And it's our responsibility to follow these. Important point in conducting research is confidentiality and anonymity. This is particularly true when it comes to peer reviewing or making certain opinions where you are doing a kind of anonymous uh, comments, there one must not disclose, uh, 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 disclose one's identity. Accountability and legality, because we are ultimately supported by public money, we, have, we are accountable and we, we have to follow the, the, the legal requirements that come with uh, that support or even as an individual, we have certain legal obligations we need to we need to follow non-discrimination and social responsibility because ultimately we have multiple responsibilities as, as a researcher. We have obligations to society to honor the trust placed by others because uh, as I said, as a researcher, I have trust of society. If I do something wrong, society on the, in the beginning will trust me, but then later on find out, okay, something was wrong. And this not only puts a uh, cascading a negative compact, it also puts a kind of disrespect for the whole, whole uh, system of researchers. And, 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 and that is something that we need to avoid. One, so one has obligation of oneself to not violate scientific values and ethics. Accountability to, so, to society, since research is mostly funded by public money, we must make sure that every money, every penny that we spent in our labs or in ourselves is ultimately coming from public money. And, and we need to be accountable and we need to make sure that it's put to best use. And general obligation to act in ways that serve the humanity because researchers are kind of drivers of, uh, of the social advancement and therefore their driving force must be driven by the idea to serve the humanity. Now, this is what research results in generation of information and which are to be then disseminated. And so researcher is the owner of new knowledge. And this new knowledge needs to be spread to uh, shared with others. One is for self-satisfaction. I feel very happy, okay, I discovered this and uh, I, I feel kind of elated. So that's one purpose. But if I do not tell others, that elation no meaning. So therefore uh, the sharing with others is firstly for self-satisfaction. Second, as a social responsibility, because if I gain some new knowledge, as a member of society, I should share that knowledge with others, like teachers uh, share their knowledge with students, uh, the researchers share, share their knowledge with other peer, uh, other researchers, and also for society, for developing 
for application and wealth generation. That's where the applied research becomes important. In academic domain, research publications are the major mode of dissemination of new uh, research output. We, uh, mostly, we do not go for patents. Patents are more for applied value uh, research, but basic research, the, which of course lies at the root of applied research, the information uh, dissemination happens to research publications. And as uh, one philosopher stated, to, to get to know, to discover, to publish, this is the destiny of a scientist. We sometimes get tired of publications, uh, trying to pub uh, publish in something again and again, but that's our destiny. We have to keep on trying, we have to keep on improving ourselves, and that's how it goes on. Now, one of the things that happens in publication, now I come to more specific uh, points about uh, ethics. The first part in dissemination is authorship, as to who are writing that publication, what responsibility for of authors. Now, again, as I said, that scientists, researchers themselves have uh, made these guidelines. So there is a committee on publication ethics. Again, it's, it's not a, any government agency. It's a community of scientists, community of researchers who have come together and who have who keep on designing these uh, pub, uh, ethics. And these are freely available at this website, publications, uh, and this can be easily searched. And I think every researcher should read the guidelines that are given there. And these are guidelines are on all aspects authorship, conduct of research, the animal ethics, human ethics, every aspect. Now, first thing is who can be an author? A basic requirement is an author contributes in at least one or more of the following. Either conception and or design of the work, acquisition, analysis, and or interpretation of data generated, collected during the work. Now this can involve students, this can involve uh, seniors, young ones, and uh, anybody who has uh, actually acquired, analyze, interpret the data uh, is entitled to the author. Somebody who has conceived and designed the work is entitled to author. Drafting, editing the work or revising it critically and thus contributing intellectually to important content is also entitled to the author. Sometimes, say so that these two groups, uh, uh, those who conceive, those who acquire, they have written a manuscript and they share with someone to asking to critically revise and modify and if that revision is really critical, and if all the groups agree, that person is also entitled to be an author, but not required to be an author by, by rule. It's, it's on the entire uh, agreement of all the three people that uh, who, who can be an author. And uh, in multi-author articles, it is it should be very clearly definable as to what each author has done. That this becomes a very important, uh, particularly in the current context when we have so many uh, cases of illegal activities, unethical activities, that one should know what one has done to be sure about uh, the contributions. Most of the contemporary research output is multi-authored, multi-institutional, because as we go on for more and more collaborative things, we have more, uh, more than two authors, uh, 10, 15, it can be even hundreds in some cases. So there it becomes very critical to know who are authors and how, why are the authors. The, and what is their order? In multi-author public, uh, publications, it's often taken to reflect relative contributions. The name that comes first uh, is supposed to believe more or uh, several people can be kind of equally contributed. So that's identified as first authors. They can be one first author, they can be multiple first authors, depending on what's the quantum of work, how many people have been involved in uh, collecting the data, analyzing the data, so they can be given the first author book and then one or more as corresponding author. These are generally, generally minded. I'm not saying always. Generally, they can be corresponding. That means who correspond, take, take major responsibility in the, in the process of publication. And others can be co-authors. Now, in, in some of the large groups where there are hundreds of authors, they have a tradition of listing authors alphabetically. And with a note uh, sometime that all authors made equal countries, so all are first authors. Now, this, this varies upon individual system. An important point is order of authorship should be joint decision. It cannot be dictatorial. It should be a, uh, uh, an ethical requirements and for a good relationship between various authors, it should be a joint decision. They can be discussed and agreed upon. 
The corresponding author takes primary responsibility for communication with the journal during the manuscript submission, peer review, publication process, and also ensure the journal's administrative requirements. But of course, corresponding author takes the responsibility, but at the same time, corresponding author must keep all other authors informed of the development that are happening. It's not that one, they have written the paper, corresponding author goes on corresponding with the journal without any reference to the other authors. Each author must be kept updated about what's happening to the uh, manuscript. And, and then you see, if, even after paper is published, the uh, corresponding author responsibility does not cease because while publishing, they, they take up a responsibility about details of authorship, ethics committee approval, documentation, clinical trials, and so on, conflict of interest issues. But then they need to also be responsible later on. If something happens to the published paper, somebody raises a question, somebody uh, raises a question about the material described or method described or the results described, it's a corresponding author who has a primary responsibility to respond to those things. The name of the corresponding author, general tradition of the practice in current, current times is that's usually the last, but that's not absolutely essential. It can come in the first, it can come somewhere in the middle, but as agreed upon by all authors together. First authors are those who carried out bulk of the primary work that on the basis of the article to publish. In case of, uh, uh, in the current practice, the most of the PhD work when it's published, the student who has carried out the work remains the first author. That's the general principle. Now, what is unethical authorship? Because there are lots of issues. There are ethical authorship and there are unethical authorship. One is case authorship. When authorship is based on exclusively on the expectation that the inclusion of someone who made no useful contribution to the study would improve the chances of the work getting accepted. For example, you know somebody who has a, a good name in, in a given field and you request, okay, you also be an author so that a paper can be accepted. Now, this is guest authorship when that person uh, hasn't contributed anything, his or her inclusion in the authorship name will be unethical. Or it can be for personal gain that, okay, I, I can get some money because if I'm an author or I offer money to someone to become an author uh, so that acceptance of my paper improves, that's unethical. Or to help boost everyone's academic performance index. Because today, as I said, in academic uh, assessment, number of publications and authorship and so on become important. So if we make five authors, everybody gets benefit. Now that is unethical because they are not contributed, they should not be all. Then the similar thing is honorary or gift authorship because somebody is head of the department or of institution or uh, I, I include name of my colleague so that colleague also includes my name in paper, this is unethical. Surrogate authorship, Manuscripts are written or got written by someone else without any original data. There are, there are companies now which will manufacture paper for you. You just say this area and they will manufacture something. You have not done anything. This is fabricated data. And obviously they will find place in useless predatory or vulgar journals, not in real good journals. But this also does happen. And, and this can be uh, found in days, lots of problems later on. Then there is a ghost authorship of one kind where somebody participated in the in research or data analysis or writing the manuscript, but then his or her name is excluded because of some personal reasons and so on. So that you make that person kind of a ghost was there, but is no more there. This is unethical. Another kind of ghost, ghost authorship, which is which is not unethical, is that somebody, uh, you may take help of a professional writer on permanent or honorary basis. This should, help should be acknowledged, but that person doesn't become an author. Although that person has written, contributed to the writing of the paper as a professional, because now there are many professional agencies who will write a manuscript for you based on the data that you provide. So that's a mutual exchange of ideas and exchange of language and so on. And for which they are paid or they're acknowledged, but, but this, they, they don't become author just because of that region that they wrote the manuscript. In scientific research, we do not have any anonymous authorship. Authorship should be of a real name. In literature, we can have anonymous authors because there are pet names and pseudonyms that are used, but not in scientific research or in formal academic research publications. There's nothing like anonymous authorship. 
In publications, we have to follow no multiple submission. I cannot submit same manuscript at two journals or three journals at the same time. Only once with journals we submit and we wait till a decision made, accepted, rejected, modified. Then we can decide to go for a second submission, not at the same time. Likewise, same set of data can be published multiple times. You may reproduce data from one paper published in another paper published due acknowledgement, either you are writing a review or there's something that is based on earlier published, but same data or a part of same data can be published second time because that will be unethical. Sometimes some journals ask us to suggest potential reviewers who can be peer reviewers for our uh, journal uh, article and they want us to name. We must suggest these potential reviewers without any conflict of interest, not somebody that I know of, somebody that is related to me academically in some ways or somebody who is collaborating with me. No, they must be real good uh, in independent peer reviewers. When, when if, if in a published paper we detect an error, it is ethically required for the authors to make that correction. And this correction can happen in multiple ways. They can either suggest that this, is, this was wrong, this should be read like this, or if it's more serious, authors can decide to withdraw a paper. Uh, and which is much better than editor or publisher withdrawing a paper because of malpractice. If author themselves accept that, okay, there was something wrong, they are not happy with the published paper and they want to withdraw it, that is much more uh, honorable than otherwise. The other requirement is if we describe some new material or some uh, the, the, the new reagent in our published paper, we are required to be uh, sharing that with somebody who wants it. We cannot just say that, no, we publish it uh, uh, and we will not share the material, we will not share the antibody or, for example, a clone or something that we have developed. If we don't share, that is unethical. And uh, there are papers that have been retracted because author did not share. The general decided that paper because they don't like it. And, and they can be ethical issues, they can be uh, legal issues arising out of it. Similarly, withdrawal or retraction of published paper, this is ethically required. If something is wrong detected by the author themselves, someone else points it out, editor detect it. At that stage, if a correction can be made, that can be done. If not, if it is, if the results have been pub prepared unethically, publication has some unethical practice, anybody can retract and withdraw. And a punishment can also follow this kind of, depending upon uh, how serious the unethical issues uh, practices were involved. Reviewers, editors, and publishers have their own ethical issues that they, they must follow. Editors and peer reviewers should adhere to ethical factors defined by COPE, which is, uh, again, I'll not go into details of this. An important point is also, again, conflict of interest. I should not accept to review a paper if someone uh, with whom I have some interest otherwise uh, can, can influence my decision. And that's where now every place, when you submit a manuscript, when we review it we, uh, as an editor, we have to declare conflict of interest. It can, can there be any conflict of interest? And then the editor can take a decision to go ahead or not to go ahead. Confidentiality, this is a very important part because when you submit a manuscript, editor knows that manuscript, what we have discovered. Reviewers who are reviewing know what that uh, new results are. No one else knows about it at this time. Now, these two uh, groups, they have uh, their privy to the new idea, new uh, information until it is published. And if they use this idea, while the paper is not published, and in their own studies, that's what we call as idea plagiarism. This plagiarism, uh, generally we think plagiarism is only copying words and so on, but copying an idea is also plagiarism. And this is very critical for editors and reviewers not to do it. We know of cases where this has happened. It's very difficult to prove it, but then it, it results in a bad uh, situation. And one of the requirements uh, to be an editor to reviewer is to maintain this confidentiality. And we must remember that publication research output is a social responsibility and therefore should not be taken as a purely commercial activity that, okay, I publish a paper and earn money out of it. No. 
publish your predatory bogus your journals unethical. I'll talk a, a little bit about the journals. Publishers, editors, and reviewers of false scholarly articles must be vigilant to avoid any possible unethical misconduct on their part or on part of the authors. Nobody should be involved in this kind of uh, activity at any point. That, that is something to be understood very well. Now, the other important issue that happens is supervisor and student relationship. Because this is where almost 90% of research comes out of this relationship between supervisor and student. Doctoral degree is a training to learn, carry research independently. That's the basic purpose of, of giving a doctoral degree that the person now is capable of independent research. It is different from teacher-student relationship that happens in a classroom. You see, we have students in class, we have students in lab. The relationship between teacher and super, PhD supervisor and PhD student is different. It requires continued dialogue for synergy and involvement in planning and execution of the plan with a good matching of the wavelength. Now, this this way, anybody can understand that unless they have same goal, same objective of finding something new in an ethical way, the relationship cannot go on very well. Students need to write and choose the doctor supervisor in view of his or personal research interests and competence. Now, this is again very important. A student who had done master's degree at joining PhD program is not a blank slate that, okay, uh, put me anywhere and I'll do research. Each student has one's own choice, one's own questions, one's own ideas. And therefore, unless the supervisor matches with that, things don't work it out. And, 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 and that must, that matching of wavelengths has to be done. And supervisor must also understand that a research will not need a technical help that boom, I say, do this, do this, do this. It has to be through a mutual understanding and discussion. Student must understand the research strategy and participate in finalization of the modus operandi of data collection, recording observations and interpretation. So there has to be a continuous dialogue that goes on. It, it cannot be a monologue that uh, teacher, supervisor tells the student do this and student comes out and say, I've done this, this is the uh, result. Now you find out what it means. No, it has to be a continuous dialogue. Supervisor to guide and steer progress. One of the responsibilities of supervisor is that the research efforts are to be supervised so that doctoral thesis can be generally completed within the stipulated time frame. Because doctoral thesis, university regulations provide a certain time frame, and when a supervisor has to make sure the student does the uh, work uh, within that time frame in, in an appropriate manner. And so, a good foundation ethical practices is essential to prepare quality future researchers and leaders. If we don't do it, we are failing our responsibility and we face the consequences in the future times to come. Doctoral thesis is a candidate's lasting record of work carried out by him or her and for which the doctoral degree is awarded. And therefore, it's a, not that, okay, you write on your master exams, nobody will see that answer script later on except the examiner. But a thesis, once you've written and submitted, remains a permanent record in library your own collection, the supervisor's collections, and therefore that's as you make sure that it's written something that even if you look at 50 years later, you feel happy about what you have written. Doctoral thesis should include only the work actually carried out by the scholar. Now this is a requirement to be given, and this, this has to be followed. That not that someone else's work I, I include in my thesis and say it's my work, no. It has to be actually done by the person who is submitting thesis. But sometimes it does happen that we need to involve, include additional but close related work being simultaneously carried out in the lab or in other collaborators' lab so that my own results can be properly appreciated comprehensively. And, but this contribution of someone else must be unambiguously identified and acknowledged within the thesis itself. You, one should be very clearly identified where the results are described that this set of results is based on finding of so-and-so and, -so and, 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 and who has contributed, what should be clearly identified. The work must be executed ethically and the same must be presented in the thesis following all the basic ethical principles like refraining from plagiaries, manipulations of data and or images, which unfortunately have become rather common in recent times thanks to the software capabilities and the easy available of data. The manipulation part has become very common, but that's where it is our responsibility that we 
uh, refrain from any such manipulation and plagiarism. Other important point that we need to understand is who can be authored based on publication and a student's thesis. The work is categorized by student, and therefore, who were the right to be authored? The supervisor may, in, may or may not include his or her name as an author. It depends on how much was his or her actual contribution, even intellectual contribution, to the research work and the manuscript. Accordingly, supervisor may permit PhD scholar to publish independently. Uh, the thesis work can be published just with student's name. This is if supervisor has agreed and uh, uh, appreciate that yeah, this is something that were done in, in entirely by the student. Supervisor, however, must not publish the doctoral work of a student without student's name. Sometimes student goes away after publishing, doesn't publish anything. As a supervisor, I cannot publish that work without student's name and without student's uh, uh, concurrence. Uh, the other thing that, is, that I noticed in recent times is becoming very common is that a thesis uh, has to have research papers also published before submission. And there are a number of research papers and each research paper has multiple authors. And the work included in those papers is exactly what is included in the thesis. Now this is unethical because on one hand, the supervisor and the student gives a certification that this work has been carried out entirely by the student. If so, why should we have so many other authors unless they have contributed something intellectually or some, but then if they have contributed, if they have contributed some actual experiments which are part of that uh, those published paper and the data is included in the thesis, then as I said earlier, they must be clearly acknowledged. If it's not acknowledged, and the whole thesis is published as a, a given chapter is published as a paper, uh, verbatim or very similar or same set of data, but have multiple authors, then this is unethical unless the role of each of the author can be defined unambiguously. This is happening in recent times so that every student's uh, number of papers goes high, but that's unethical. Intellectual property is something that we know. Any creative output of a person's mind is intellectual property. There, and therefore there are intellectual property rights. Once you have property, we have right and we have uh, obligations. So we intellectual property rights, the IPR. These are usually give the creator an exclusive right over the use of his or her own creation. And in this sense, the research publication that we make are also our intellectual property and we have certain rights on them. Industrial IPR, which is what we typically call patents, are uh, involving money. They have the uh, intellectual pat patent right is for a certain period of time. But for research publication, the right of authors is perpetual. We must include their names whenever we want to say something of that. Although in recent time, there have been uh, some kind of uh, codification of these uh, inter uh, publication rights, and, and these have been are defined in terms of Creative Commons licenses. This is again not done by any government. These are again group of people who have come together and did the CC licenses. And there are several categories, CC BY, CC BY ESA, and so on and so forth. And this chart here describes what can be carried out by others without requiring permission from the authors or something. But for example, if somebody something is published and somebody wants to copy and publish, one needs to have uh, author's permission to do it, attribution requirement. That means you must acknowledge who has done this, except something that has come in public domain. For example, if you want to define, I mean, let's talk, let's talk something about uh, gravity, you don't need to cite Einstein, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Isaac Newton now. You want to say DNA double helix, we don't need to say uh, Watson and Crick. Even if we say Watson Crick discovered, we don't need to refer to that paper because they have become public domain. But anything else that we want to quote, we must define as to who has done this. That's what attribution is required, which can be used for commercially. Again, there are different kinds of licenses. If they say NC, that means non-commercial. They cannot be used, information on some paper can be used for any commercial activity for any uh, monetary benefits. And, and so this goes, this, this is, and this we must follow, we must understand. Now, next part I come to is to talk about how do we improve the quality of research and innovations. 
something that we need to really worry about. But one important point to remember is quality research requires passion, not fashion or compulsion. I don't do research because everyone else is doing research. Or I don't do research because my promotion requires me to do research and therefore I do it. I do research because of my passion. Something that comes from my heart, comes from my brain that I must find out. Then only research becomes good quality. Major advance occurs when results do not agree with the expected. Now, this is an important point to remember that when we take when we take up a research question, it's because we know something, and therefore we ask a question. And immediately at the moment we ask a question, we also have a possible answer or a possible hypothesis. And then we do the experiment to find out, uh, experiment or theoretical analysis or whatever it is, to find out whether the result that come out are in agreement with what we predicted or they don't. But remember, sometimes we, we expect because of a certain uh, previous ideas, oh, but we find that things are becoming different. And we worry that, okay, my results have gone wrong. I've done things, something wrong, and I've tried to results which agree with the expected. We have not really made any advance in that state. Advance in knowledge happens only when you find something which does not agree with the expected because then only you give a new idea, new hypothesis, new interpretation. That's where major advance happens. And major advance often requires out of the box ideas, something not which is described in textbook or something which is not expected. And they often originate from common sense, that you have a common sense, common question, curiosity, and therefore you do it. For example, uh, just think of C.V. Raman's uh, Raman effect, discovery. He had no supervisor, he had no research project, he didn't do any PhD, but he came out with this because he has out of the box ideas and he has some common sense to do, think how to do it. And that's what re, uh, resulted in his discovery of the Raman effect for which he got Nobel Prize. Research journals, uh, again, there are categories and different kinds. Why, why we need research journals? Because the need to share new knowledge generated through research with others led to publication of scholarly journals by academic institutions and if you go back 200 years ago, individual researcher will uh, write a monograph and publish oneself. But then as the number increased, we, we came into a uh, situation where there are academic institutions, there are academic societies, and they decided to publish, collect the information from their members and the faculty and publish that. So that's where the research journals happened. But as this became more and more common, that research publication are the major mode of dissemination. As this became more common, there the greater demand for scholarly publications, and this has attracted commercial publishers now. It's not only academic institutions, society that publish, but there are commercial publishers, uh, and, and they have become very, very big publishers who now take the major share in scholarly publications. The commercial interests have positive effects, but also lots of negative consequences. We'll talk about some of these uh, as, as we go along. Now, one of the negative effects of commercial publications, what, we, what has been named as predatory journal. This term was coined by BL in 2007 or so for, for journals, which he called uh, the predator, which have little or no peer review system and which are primarily focused on making money from the, the gullible authors and whom they call as prey. So the journals are preying upon the authors. Why, why should authors pay? Why, why are they gullible? Because uh, as I'll talk a little later, there are conditions where somebody wants to have a publication. And so pays money and gets published. And that's where these journals come in. They have little academic quality. They publish anything for money. That's the major problem. Uh, and there have been uh, kind of sting operations, complete nonsense submitted as a informed manuscript and the journal publish it after taking some money without realizing what they are publishing. And that's where the British journals became unfortunate, partly unfortunate for India that a large number of uh, authorship and the journals were published from India. And uh, now things, not that they are published only from India, they're very advanced countries which also publish their journals, but a good number is, has been coming out of uh, this country. Over the years, different names have been given for substandard questionable journals or predatory journals. There's somebody called predatory journals, 
because uh, they do not meet scholarly publishing and they will publish anything for money. Some call them as pseudo journals that they, uh, because they have copied someone else's names or they, they, they identify fake papers, do not provide uh, peer review, they just publish something. Hijack journal, where a journal hijacks name of a standard journal and publishes something in the name of that same journal. This is predatory of the category, but they are also called a hijack journal. And then uh, somebody has analyzed that, okay, uh, th there have been different agencies that have listed predatory journals. There's a BS list, and then there have been several other lists. And somebody compared these lists and found that they don't match each other. So there's no common definition, but there's some common attributes of predatory journals. These are, for example, they give false, false and misleading information about themselves. Their websites and emails may present contradictory statements, fake impact factors, incorrect addresses, questions of editorial board, false claims of indexing or membership of associations, and misleading claims about the rigor of peer review. Any of them is one feature that predatory journals or are the journals of substandard journals follow it. They deviate from the best editorial publication practice. They have no defined retraction policy. They, do, they, they claim copyright despite, it, despite publishing it as an open access. Because once it's, it's an open access, the publisher has no copyright. The copyright is now transferred to the public domain uh, and to the authors. But, and they do not define which of the Creative Commons CC license they are following because they themselves are doing, uh, not aware of it. They completely lack in transparency in operation procedures. What are, how are the editorial decisions taken? They do not describe. A good journal will always on its website describe all these informations in a very clear way that how do they decide what is the basis of peer review, what kind of fees they charge, who are the uh, to be person to be contacted for what burn. And the editors and EB members are not verifiable because we do not know. I mean, I may not be uh, aware if I'm an editor of some such journals, which I just put my name without my knowledge. And, 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 and this is a risk that many of us carry, that we may be kind of listed as editors in some journals without our knowledge, but these journals are typically of this uh, unwarranted category. The other important common feature of these such journals is they will keep on sending you emails and posters and so on about their journals that we uh, need a manuscript for our issue next month and so on and so forth. And when, when you realize this kind that this is aggressive and kind of solicitation is, for example, if I receive uh, from a journal in chemistry or journal material science or journal of economics, to submit a manuscript, obviously that journal doesn't know who am I and, and they are sending it to everyone. So these emails keep on coming every day, every week or every month. And, and this, if this happens, you must understand that these journals are meaningless, bogus journals. Their, 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 their quality is very poor. Their only purpose is intent to deceive, to just make money uh, out of the publication that you submit to them. Now there are literary conferences. That's another thing that has happened because uh, the conference participation is also taken as an academic uh, activity. And so people have started to organize the conferences uh, and now with the online system, this has become much more common because you do not know who is actually attending, who is not attending. You pay a registration fee so that you can get a link. And then uh, neither that link is operative nor the conference is organized, but the organizer has collected some money and, and the person who has paid the money gets a certificate without hold, uh, attending or holding any actual offline or online event. So one has to be very careful about attending such predatory conferences. Why should predatory journals flourish? Uh, uh, there, there have been many articles. I've also written some articles on this. One of the things that I wrote in 2015 to bring attention in India about what are predatory journals and how they're polluting our academic environment. One of the reasons is the increasing commercialization. It's a full industry and it's one of the most profit-making industries. Some of the big publishers, they themselves, their accounts show that they make 30 to 40 percent profit. No major industry had this high profit margin. It's, and this is why uh, many people want to take to this industry and earn money. 
one the other reason is that because we are asked to publish so many papers unless i have two papers i cannot submit thesis and i have four papers i cannot be eligible for uh, could be considered for an appointment and so once you have this number then you need a certain number of papers and that's where pediatric journals provide a good forum and then the other thing is the open access charges something that happened that has happened in last uh, one or two decades that we need to pay Hello. Hello, sir. Hmm. Sir, uh, please unmute your mic. Okay, right. So uh, I get back. The, okay. This open access charges has become a worldwide issue now. And because uh, funding agencies and authors agreed that they will pay charge to a journal to make their article easily readable by, by any. This is what predictive publishers found a very good source of funding that they can just go ahead with it and uh, make good money. And this has been one, one region uh, uh, stimulating factor for publishing uh, these printed journals. Official policy analysis of quantity rather than quality that catalyze and sustain the rapid growth of this unwarranted industry. The unfortunate what has happened is many established journals now have their second grade journals, where you're, when you submit a manuscript, the manuscript gets rejected and the editor writes, that if you agree, you transfer your manuscript to another journal, which can possibly publish it after its so-called independent review, but where you have to pay. I consider such journals also predatory because there, if a paper is not acceptable for publication in one journal for reasons of quality, how it can be considered publishable in another journal on payment of money. If it is not payment of money, I can understand. But if it's on payment of money, I consider them as predatory. And this is what, again, there have been two articles uh, that I've written about. And then the uh, one thing that I've recently argued is, why do we need to pay open access charges? In good old times, we, we followed this when there were no internet, where there were no subscription and libraries and so on. When a paper was published and we got to know it, we will write to the author, send a postcard, uh, what we call as a reprint request card, and the author will send a, a hard copy reprint uh, in return. Why don't we do the same thing? Almost every reader, every author has internet access, has an email account. So it just when once you get to know a public about a published paper, just send an email to send me a PDF file, and they should send it. And that's it. There, there, there's no limitation to open access. I I, I practice this myself, and in ninety percent cases, I get my reprint within few minutes or uh, within few uh, hours or days. And, and so I can exit them. And this is what I published in a discussion opinion article in Indian Academy of Science Confluence. This is freely accessible. And I think we must practice this more so that they, we don't need to pay open access charges. Don't waste that money on open access charges. Uh, make use of it for research. Now, how do we select a journal for submission of new manuscript? What are, what are the criteria that I will follow? One is that a journal must have appropriate credibility and reputation. It is likely to be read by fellow workers. That means people who work in my area of work should also be referred to that journal, should be able to look at it. Now, the other important point that comes in, whether an article that I've written is a review, is a long research paper or a short research paper, a brief communication, is a letter to editor, it's a commentary or an opinion piece. All journals do not publish every kind of article. Some journals publish all of them, some journals publish only reviews, some journals publish only research articles. They do not publish commentary. And so, so one has to choose, uh, look at their journal website, what kind of article they accept before submitting to them. What is the previous history of publication? How much that journal takes to process a manuscript? 
and I know in biomedical sciences, generally we take it three to six months as a good processing time. If most articles published in that journal are taking longer than six months or taking shorter than one month, I should be worried about submitting to that, that journal. Because shorter than one month means there are no good peer reviewing. Even if uh, how uh, uh, quick the editor and the peer reviewers are, it's very difficult that the whole process gets completed within one month and paper gets published. Now, how do we know about this? Most journals now give date of uh, receipt of manuscript date of acceptance and date of final publication. From this, we can make out what is the processing time that they, they needed. What kind of public articles are published in that journal? We can just have a look at the titles and abstracts and the possible full, full length articles, what quality they are published. If they're poor quality, I don't want to be their uh, companion. If they're good quality, I would like to be, yes. Prefer peer reviewed journals published by established academies and learned societies and universities rather than independent journals published by commercial agencies. I would always prefer an academic association for a journal for publication, something which has been established for a long time and which has an associate with the academic people. These journals are likely to be better than purely commercial journals. The other thing we need to not differentiate is so called national and international journals. I'm aware that many of our funding agencies want this information, but we need to argue. I've been arguing about this. Many people, others are arguing, and more and more people need to argue that this is nonsense. A journal is a journal. There's nothing like national and international journal. If we recognize a journal, we recognize journal as uh, nothing like national and international journal. And so when I submit a manuscript, I do not differentiate whether it's I'm submitting a national or international journal. <laughs> I would avoid payment of open access charges. Share the PDF files as I said before and save that money for active research. Avoid journals inviting articles for rapid publication through legacy. Mark all such emails as spam. And I think that's what I would recommend everyone else to do. If you keep on receiving mails from such publishers, never respond to them and mark them spam so that next time they, they, they do not disturb you, irritate you. And others also do not receive such emails. The other thing that I would recommend us to follow is preprint archive. They have, they have become more common in recent years. Uh, some, some disciplines have been doing it for a long time. In biomedical sciences, it started about 10 years ago. One, one example is BioArchive, published by Coldspring Harbor Lab. It's published every day. And what this preprint archive is, you can submit your manuscript without before you submit to a journal. Uh, to this preprint archive. And typically, if your manuscript doesn't have any serious ethical issue like wrong practices or plagiarism or something, by 24 hours, it's available on the web. Absolutely free, neither to the author nor to the reader. There's no chance to anyone. It is public sharing of unpeer reviewed manuscripts. Now, remember, this is unpeer reviewed. And that's what they call preprint archive. An important point of this is that you can publish it. It also gives you a digital object identifier number so that it remains a permanent record. And it also ensures against idea plagiarism because once you submit a manuscript to a standard journal, it goes for a reviewer, a reviewer can steal your idea. But once you put it in preprint archive, you can always claim that this idea is yours. And an important point to remember is that most journals now accept articles that have been placed on preprint archives. They, they will not qualify for plagiarism, as long as the authors are saying, and, and it state that this is in published as preprint archive. And so this should be practiced more and more. Actually, the arrangement with BioArchive is that many journals have arranged that once you have submitted your manuscript to uh, upload it on BioArchive, you can straight away transfer with one click to a given journal. It lists a large number of journals which will accept manuscripts straight away from BioArchive submission so that you don't need to do it twice. And, and this provides for a good uh, facility because they ensure a claim for priority and also facilitate informed feedback from peers because like on uh, social media, preprint archives also provide for you to write a comment if you want to write a comment. And this can be useful for the authors to improve the manuscript when they prepare it for formal sub submission. But then the point is sometimes uh, the submission manuscript may take a year or two to publish, but a preprint archive is already available so you can uh, and they are citable. One can cite the articles which are published in good uh, pre, uh, preprint archives. 
and, and therefore this is important. But unfortunately, now the predatory preprint server souls have become available. Who charge money, they say they are preprint archive, they charge money, but then, and you can place anything there. Now this is wrong. We, we do not have any uh, payment for preprint service. And standard preprint archive do not levy any charge on authors, but provide eternal. Remember, this is eternal, full access to the preprints. Now, uh, one more point that I missed uh, stating earlier was that you cannot withdraw your preprint from a pre standard preprint archive. If you have made a mistake, you can write a revision and publish a revision. You, you can publish multiple revisions on a preprint archive. You can keep on revising your uh, manuscript that you uh, publish three months ago or one year ago, two years ago, you can always revise it, but you cannot withdraw it. So if you have done some uh, unethical practice that remains on record what you have done. And therefore do not use preprint server that charge the authors, plagiarism and other malpractices are rampant in these money-making enterprises. This must not be, uh, must be remembered. And I personally do not worry about impact. I know that's uh, something, uh, a serious issue with uh, people who are looking for jobs, with looking for uh, promotions and recognitions, that impact factor is taken as a major point. But I think we need to make it, there are uh, more and more people are talking about it and more and more people should keep on talking about impact factor is not for personal assessment. We must understand this. Eugene Garfield, who coined the term impact factor in 1984, himself has very categorically stated that impact factor of a journal must not be used for assessing an individual or an institution. Unfortunately, because of commercial pressure, this has become such an important issue and, and we need to get out of this system. Where, why we publish, where we publish should be our pleasure rather than compulsion. Not that because if somebody said that you must publish in this, therefore I publish, no, it's my choice. Only compulsion can be for not publishing in a predatory or bogus journals. We need to promote good journals in India. Uh, we should publish also in journals published in India. Not that we publish only journals published in India, but also we need to publish in journals in India. Only those that have good peer review system, not predatory or bogus journals. Say no to publication charges, especially the open access charges. I personally will never publish anything where I have to pay charges. And as Sivirman believed, flourishing quality journals in India is a must for our science leadership in science. I recently wrote an article, or two years ago, wrote an article in uh, Editorial Current Science that why are Indian journals making, uh, uh, not making a progress? And my main point was, if established scientists in the country do not wish to publish even some of their research output in Indian journals, do not wish to seriously review manuscripts for their journals, and more importantly, directly or indirectly penalize, irrespective of the quality of work, those who publish, these journals would, not continue, would continue to struggle and fail to become internationally competitive. Enemy is thus us only. If we do not publish it, the journals will improve. I admit that the senior scientists of my generation have really been, been enemies in a way, but the young generation must make sure that you fight out the issue, you ensure that your quality of work is considered, not the name of the journal. Because this is where uh, uh, at Indian National Science Academy, we, we formulated a set of guidelines, which is separate to all the uh, funding agencies like CSR, DSC, DBT, ICMR, ICR, and so on. And in principle, they've agreed that they follow this. The main question is ask what rather than where published not the name of the journal should be important, what is published should be important. And I think we, we need to follow it in letter and spirit. Uh, finally, uh, I, I, as I was told by the organizer that this book has been available, this has some good articles, and I think you make good use of it. And with that, I'll, uh, because we, we must remember this statement in civil life, law flaws, unless we follow ethics, we can, cannot have civilized life. So with that, I thank you all for your attention and will be happy to take uh, questions if there, as the time permits.
thank you sir it's a great gift from you in this teachers day is a is a pleasure you covered lots of lots of thing and it uh, also uh, and help to understand that what is ethical and what is non ethical because sometimes we do something it look like ethical to someone but maybe it's non ethical uh activities so i have collected few questions uh, i will ask you but before that i request soma to do a interview to you because we already listen your speech and in the interview you also may also include something so it automatically answer few questions if there are uh, rest i will ask you okay thanks i i'll be ready to answer questions right okay. soma Uh, hello everyone we will now proceed with the interview session am i audible yes okay um sir uh, this is a short interview session so that we can know you better and what your views are uh, sir uh, my first question would be if you would be uh, if you would share your journey as a scientist with our viewers okay that's a difficult question because it's a long journey but then as a scientist and let let me say it it has been a very remarkable journey a uh, lot of struggles a lot of pleasures and ultimately in the end of it more pleasure than struggle because pleasure comes only when you struggle if if you because the, the, these are very very relative terms and 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 this has been a, a pleasure has been to have been involved to have been uh, get answers to questions that have, that have been burning in heart The, as i said passion very important mm -hmm. and so when the when i when i moved from one area to the other it's not because that area was becoming fashionable because but that area could provide me an answer to some question that i had in the process we started with uh, lots of uh, techniques one important point that i have always tried to do is try to learn new techniques state of the art thing that are current currently um, and keep on evolving what we learned in our masters classes and bachelor's classes with a set of techniques and then that prepared in certain ways but then as we moved along newer and newer methods kept on coming in and the idea has always been to get acquainted with these techniques learn one, oneself learn from others and very often having been working in university system with uh, limited resources mm. we had to be innovative we had to fabricate many sophisticated equipments ourselves but in a simple way and that's where i say common sense it becomes important like i remember when we uh, with one of my student tapas mukhopa that we discovered that the hs omega gene is non coding at that time it called 93d puff some a question that i've been trying to answer for almost 10 years couldn't do it because we didn't have money to buy a gel process uh, vertical gel system and a gel dryer and so on and so forth tapas built it with his own hand wow <laughs> and then we discover this gene doesn't make a protein 1982 when selfish dna was at its peak just in 1980 crick and others had suggested that a lot of dna doesn't make protein and selfish and useless and we discover a protein that a gene that we thought was is interesting is a non coding one not I, I can claim that was one of the first non-coding gene that was discovered in Drosophila and is, is explained. But then, I'm happy that some journal published it. Chromosoma published this paper, okay. but it was a real struggle against the wall because anything that nonsense, uh, selfish, can't be funded. My contemporary uh, competitors in Heidelberg and MIT didn't get funding for working on this gene. Fortunately for me in India, I could get some funding. and interestingly my bhatnagar prize happens on this gene <laughs> that's that's something very interesting and yeah. i think it, and and i consider very lucky to have in working in india that i could get funding could go along and now of course we know non coding rna has become so important mm -hmm. everything there are many many more papers on non coding rna than on protein coding genes now and and this is again i feel very happy that way back in 1996 i had predicted that non coding rna will be very important 
I wrote a review. And as my habit has been, I, I put my uh, ideas often in Indian journals. This is one thing that I decided way back in 1972, when I started my independent career, that any research paper that comes out of my lab, my work, 50% of it will be in journals outside India, 50% in India, irrespective of, uh, it was kind of alternate cycle. Mm -hmm. If one paper has gone to a journal outside India, next paper must go to a journal in India. The only re re requirement being, journal must have good reviewing practice, good publication mm -hmm. practice. And I'm, I'm very happy to say now, uh, I've actually done this uh, kind of impact factor assessment and citation assessment. Impact factor wise, my total impact factor may be very, very low. Average impact factor may be less than two even for all, all my papers put together. But citation wise, my papers in Indian journals and papers in uh, journals outside India are nearly equal citation. And therefore I can say with uh, confidence that publishing in Indian journals had not had any disadvantage to me. Mm -hmm. And right. something that I can uh, also tell young people to feel happy about it, that despite my low impact factor sort of, mm -hmm. I've been included in top 2% balance in the world. I'm included in the top 2% of the all, all research get members in terms of my impact. So I, I think what is important is the same point, not where published, what is published. Okay. And right. as long as, and, and this has been one of my motto that, that has driven me all through in research, the passion continues. And I still, uh, even today, I spend whole my day in the lab. I have my research projects, I have my research students, and I want to take more students. As long as fortunately my university has allowed me a life, lifelong association, I can work in BHU, have my lab as long as I want. And, and that has been, a very satisfying experience. The scientific journey, of course, my research papers will tell what, how I moved from uh, pure chromosome work to uh, both biotechnology, molecular work, genomics work, and uh, uh, what, whatever comes in together, Drosophila remains my common organs. That has been the fascinating thing. I I'll just share one, one more issue which made me move to Drosophila. As a young child, I wanted to be a scientist and wanted to be a scientist in relation to uh, medical field, health issues. Mm -hmm. I'll not get into detail why that happened, but that happened because of some upbringing that I had experiences. But then when I uh, so in my master's in Caltech University is origin where I joined, I couldn't become a doctor because my school result was very poor in Calcutta. There was no hope of getting into medicine. I, Neither I had money to get the capitation fee nor had the merit to get into medical college. So I joined bachelor's uh, BSc course in Calcutta and uh, got, got into master's and I took parasitism as my special because of my parasites in relation to the human health. And there I worked on a protozoan organism where I thought I saw extra nuclear DNA. Okay. Unusual. Mm -hmm. I have a, my first paper is on this uh, parasite. Based on this, I went to then young uh, teacher, Dr. S. Mukherjee, who had joined the zoology department as a remarkable genetic cytogeneticist. Mm -hmm. I, joined, I went to him that I want to do research on this sexual nuclear DNA that I found out. Mm -hmm. that, that was my question that I wanted to follow for my PhD. And he candidly and should, as a, as a good teacher should do it, he said he, he is not competent to guide me on that protozoan parasite. He can guide me on Drosophila, guide me in the basics of genetics, how genes function, and then I can go back to this protozoan parasite for my later research. Fortunately, unfortunately, I've never been able to revisit that parasite. It still remains a big question, but I got hooked onto Drosophila, one of the most wonderful genetic organisms, and I enjoy working with it. That's, that's how the journey has gone on amazing thanks for sharing uh, sir uh, what motivated you to build a long career in science well long career you see it's a i i didn't i don't think that when i started as my lab in 1971 i got appointed as a faculty in Bardoan university when i was less than 26 years old i was lucky that mm -hmm. i could finish my phd uh, just for two and a half years time and could uh, get uh, get a job. 
but at that time, I didn't think that I will have a long job, but, but I knew that teaching and research is my life. I, I cannot, I was very clear in 71, even before I had a job in university, that I do not want to join a research institution. There were possibilities of my joining a research institution, but I wanted to teach. That was something very clear in my mind that I want to teach and therefore, although I had no job offer, but I did decline offers from institution, but I'm sorry, I can't. But having taken this, I enjoyed every moment of it. And therefore it has, the journey has gone. Even today, I love teaching, I love research, and therefore the, the journey keeps on getting longer as long as I live, I'll, I'll be with it. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Sir, uh, you are a reviewer for many renowned, uh, renowned uh, journals and editor of books. Uh, can you give us some key takeaway messages uh, how we can improve our manuscripts? Well, that's a improving manuscript. I think the first thing we must understand and where the, we often suffer is good language. Hmm. Language is very critical, not flowery literary language, but you know, one should be able to put one's ideas in a good, grammatically correct, logically following language. And that requires that before you write a manuscript, you must have the whole story in your mind like a video, that this is what I want to communicate, this is what I want to communicate, and it should follow logically. Absolutely. And of course, a standard manuscript has some standard format. Each journal say that you want introduction, middle methods, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Few things that we need to take care of is, each journal gives description of the style that it follows. Right. Where the material methods come before uh, results. Guidelines. Or at the end and so yes. on. The guidelines should be carefully read. Mm -hmm. How are references to be cited? Mm -hmm. How many references? What the style of citation in text and in it? This is, you know, when, when it comes to reviewing or for an editor, if you find that the authors have carelessly done anything, you are already on the negative side. <laughs> Maybe the paper is good. But then you know the you have earned a negative point. So this is something that must be understood. But more important is what are we wanting to communicate to the reader? Right. What is the carry home message? If you are also not clear, the reader cannot be clear, the reviewer cannot be clear. Mm -hmm. So these are things, and, and of course, the, the other side becomes quality of the data, quality of the and the way it has been generated. Are there mm -hmm. unethical practices? Are there something that immediately becomes apparent. You see, sometimes what happens is that this is our, our experience. Mm -hmm. I read a manuscript, introduction, first para is very nicely written. Second para, there is something, sudden mutation has happened. Language is very peculiar and you can immediately make out plagiarism. That copy and paste, now this, this, this has to be avoided. Yes. And today, of course, most journals have a kind of software that will mm -hmm. check for plagiarism. Mm -hmm. And if you're plagiarism, and, and there again, it's very standard that we do not worry about extensive similar language in material method section or in reference sections, but in the introduction and discussion and results part of there's a large similarity. And that large similarity is taken anything about 10% or 20%. Then the editor may decide not to even get, get it reviewed. See, so mm -hmm. very often what's happening is many journals will see many more manuscripts then they can handle. Mm, right. So unfortunately, the choice of the editor is to reject, not to accept, not to consider for acceptance. Yes. That, that is what that and that's unfortunate. Because many papers, good papers get rejected just because in the first glance edit thought okay, it's meaningless. Yes. The other unfortunate point that is happening is in many good journals, so-called high impact factor journals, editor cannot handle every journal. There are lots of associate editors who are mm. young people. Mm -hmm. Not that they are compet not competent, but they don't have enough experience yet. And some of them may not even know every field. Right. So they may say, okay, this is not my area that uh, has been assigned to me. I don't like it and I reject it. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this happens. Okay. In no way that a, a solution can be found out. Author can fight back. Sometimes it serves, but very often editor will simply say, sorry, we have said no and no, gate is closed. But that, that is unfortunate part, but that does happen. The more important is, again, the abstract itself is very critical. How mm. do you write the abstract? Right. Because that's the first thing that exactly. an editor or reviewer will read. Mm. Editor can't read the whole manuscript. Editor will read maybe abstract, and maybe if time is there, 
some bit of introduction and some bit of discussion. Rest is left uh, to a cursory glance. So abstract must be very, very clear. It should state very clearly background. It shouldn't go long background. Mm. It shouldn't go long description of results, nor a discussion of result, but you know, succinctly, not uh, in a very, uh, such a language that, uh, that author himself or herself cannot read later on the, what, what it meant. Mm -hmm. So it should be done. And if that is done and the question is good, the journal selection has to be again, because one of the reasons why we select, uh, we reject a manuscript is it's outside the scope of the journal. So mm -hmm. journal, there are many journals which are broad areas. Mm -hmm. There are many journals which are narrow areas. Mm -hmm. I, can, I must not submit a very broad area manuscript to a journal which is not in that area. So, so one must look at the scope of the journal, identify the manuscript, and see whether it is there or not. The other thing, that's my personal view. Okay. I would not be worrying about high impact factor publication. That's my person. And therefore, I'm not worried about building a big story. You know, where, where you want to include 10 kinds of experiments and data to read, uh, you know, so-called molecular data, so-called more uh, updated techniques and so on. To mm -hmm. me, that's all. as long as a discovery as a result makes a sense, makes some advancement, makes a story. No story can be ever complete. Uh, there will always questions raised at the end of your how well ex extensive story you do. And therefore, if questions are defined, that these are the questions that are coming up, that manuscript has a better chance, in my view, of being accepted or being considered for revision and so on. But one point that I will say is a rejection letter from an editor will infuriate us. Yes, we get angry that the editor doesn't understand and peer reviewer doesn't understand. That's a logical way of doing it. But I would fight back in a decent way. I know some journal, some papers, we have taken three years to publish. We decided we publish in this journal only because <laughs> that to appear to be most optimal. And of course, Exciting. I can take it kind of ego. Why, why should they reject it? Because I, I could make out that the reviewers are not understanding the journal. Hmm. Three, four, five revisions. Finally. <laughs> In the process, the manuscript improved because we did more experiments, we did into it, but ultimately we got it published. We had to convince, even a, a reviewer wrote, why are the authors howling? That's what the words used. <laughs> howling. <laughs> yes. Because I, we, I, I did write strongly back that, it, that the reviewer doesn't understand what we are saying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but, but then that's it. It was accepted. At one, in one case, editor even said it, paper, but we recommend that you dilute this statement. I said, mm -hmm. sorry, I don't dilute it. I did accept it, what you want to say, because we are responsible for what we are saying, not right. you. Right. The other experience that I remember and I want to share as a young student, when I was a PhD student, my supervisor allowed me to write a single article. Okay. And I was still working. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, what I put in my ethical thing, that if a supervisor can decide that okay, the student has done everything, had planned and written and done everything, why should supervisor come in picture? I submitted the manuscript to Journal Genetical Research, published from Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Hard copy those days will go by uh, uh, postal surveys and come back. Mm -hmm. Several months later, I receive a thick packet. You get worried. Thick packet means the manuscript is re rejected because those days uh, we submit three copies, two copies come back if the paper is not accepted. Okay, okay. So we're mm -hmm. disappointed. Anyway, open the envelope to see what it is. Mm -hmm. And then the surprising thing was, it did writes back that the reviewer has rewritten your paper. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, it means retyping. Remember, those days it was not that you have software, word copy, word file, and you uh, make corrections and so on. Mm -hmm. You had to manually retype the entire manuscript. Mm -hmm. the reviewer had done that. And the, the, the region, that some of my terminology that I used, context, syntax was not appropriate. Okay. The reviewer liked the word and therefore took that pain. Yeah. And, uh, and the only thing editor asked me was, if we think that we can agree with this version, they will publish it. Now, mm -hmm. this is, I think this is something that a reviewer has to do. Mm -hmm. Reviewer and editor cannot be just post office. They must. So, so true. 
Unfortunately, today, most reviewers, editors, because of commercial interest, have become post office. They'll just get something from a reviewer, pass it to the editor. Author learns from the comment that, from the reviewers and how to improve. No, no, that, that is one part. That yes. reviewer's part helps us. But you see, sometimes reviewer may make an issue with the author do not agree. Oh, right. And they, then the editor has to take a decision. I can mm-hmm. share one historical uh, event of uh, two great geneticists. Uh, one was Richard Goldsmith in 1950s and uh, his student, Kurt Stern, who became a great human geneticist and development geneticist until later on. And this is what Kurtzson writes in one of his lectures. That uh, this is way back in 1929 when he wrote a paper and, in the, and they were doing his PhD. Okay. And his uh, supervisor was, was the editor of the journal. Mm-hmm. He submits a manuscript to the, uh, to the editor criticizing supervisor's work. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is something that we, we need to appreciate. Edit, as editor, he, he returns back next to the manuscript, I mean, the response mm-hmm. that you read my paper, didn't understand them, and cursed them. I read your results, I understood them, I reject your views, your manuscript will appear in this issue. Okay. <laughs> the, the point is, that this is this is important that editors and reviewers must understand. Mm-hmm. I did not agree with the, with the author's uh, views. Because it's are authors with not editors' views. Mm-hmm. But as long as they are appropriate, as long as they have been carried out well, logically mm-hmm. explained, and, and this is what I've tried when, when sometimes I have a, a, as a review, to get into argument with an editor. I, I said, okay, this manuscript can be published. Editors say, no, no, this is uh, against the current ideas and this will look wrong. I said, look, who, who knows the current ideas are. And ultimately, it's the, it's the author's views not editors or reviewers views. That's true. And, and I think we, we need to follow this. Mm-hmm. And the author should be aware of these possibilities as well. Wow, that was great. Uh, sir, um, when you recruit a research fellow, uh, what qualities do you look for other than academic qualities? Well, academic qualities are required, but I don't look for great marks only. I look for First thing that I want to look for is, can the students speak, express coherently? So uh, I kind of interview some students that have uh, done PhD with me long back. Mm-hmm. Uh, I took more than a year to finally accept them. Okay. I rejected them. Sorry, I, I'm not happy. Student says, shall I come back three months later? All right, come back. And this went back and forth and that. So only when I'm convinced that the student has a genuine interest in research, mm-hmm. has questions in mind, and had the perseverance to pursue this. Mm-hmm. Not that everybody has been equally great. They have been among my students. Some have done much better than others. But then the general idea is that they must be able to answer question. And mm-hmm. one, one important point that I tell my prospective students is, I'm not going to tell them, do this, do this, do this. I want my students to develop their own program and I learn along with them. Sometimes we have taken a completely new area because student was interested mm-hmm. and student felt confident that, yes, I can take up this and I've learned with that, with the student, that new area. And, and this has sometimes created some problem, but sometimes very often it has been a good experience later on that my knowledge base increased itself. And mm-hmm. we could contribute in a better way. So basically what I look for in the student to take up is, of course, they should have fellowship. That's an important part because mm-hmm. not being supported and uh, being supported is, a, is an important issue. But more important is their own willingness to be adventurous. Right. Willingness to have perseverance because PhD can be very frustrating experience. Uh, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, most of my students have not taken less than five, six years. And so it can be frustrating. You can understand. But an important point that we try to give in our group is that our, our own teacher-student relationship is very different. They're all members of family. Right. We can fight, we can argue, we can love each other, we can uh, abuse each other, but that's all part of family. And ultimately, 
students uh, do not feel so depressed and uh, deprived of their other pleasures in life. That was great. Um, uh, at which point in our academic or research life uh, should we be introduced to ethics, do you think? Ethics, I think we should be introduced right from childhood. It's, it's something that has to come as part of being human being. But yes, formal ethics, each discipline has its own ethics. Uh, that has to come along with at each level, depending on what level we are. Like you see, unfortunately, what's happening today is right in school, we are teaching students to practice plagiarism. We give them assignments. And schools also, they say, write what is written in the book or what is written. If they write on their own, it's not correct. This is unfortunate. This needs to be stopped. I know with my own uh, grandchildren now, mm -hmm. when they write something, and uh, they, they, if, if they write something original, they are, they are a little worried. Their teacher may not like it because it's, you have written something different. And that's where we need to inculcate that sense of uh, eth ethical behavior there. But then for research ethics, when they are in, uh, let's say, undergraduate classes, right. they should know what research is, what, mm -hmm. what it involves, and what are the good practices in research. Mm -hmm. the, the assignment as a classroom test that we do assignment, I, I actually stopped doing assignments because what I realized was in classroom when I give assignment to students, what I get back is pure plagiarism. Mm -hmm. And paste from net or from some figure taken here and there. And, and this is something that, that we need to tell them because they go with the student go with the impression that okay because it's available on net it's their property and that's what we, we need to teach them you see most of the research students do not realize in thesis and papers and so on you see figure adapted from so and so mm -hmm. it's it's a very common practice but that's unethical mm -hmm. unless you have taken permission from the author from the publisher that you want to reproduce this figure but they think, okay, it's freely available in the internet. So what's the copy? Then copying and pasting, it's very easy. You see today. Now, these are things that we need to train them, tell them right from beginning. And, and, and I think for research ethics, undergraduate classes is something good. But sure, for PhD students, I'm glad that the coursework has been introduced in ethics. Right. I hope it is ethically taught. <laughs> that's, that's important. <laughs> Sir, uh, we're coming to the final question of the interview session. Uh, what would your words of advice be to the students and scholars who are new to the field of research? Well, the advice is, you see, it's like uh, a young person thrown out in water would have done most of it. <laughs> but as basic human beings, we can swim. As long as we don't get worried and uh, kill ourselves by going down. Mm -hmm. We can make trial and we can swim. Like you see, a newborn child can swim very easily without mm -hmm. any problem mm -hmm. because that's the inherent uh, biological system we have. So same way, research, asking questions, seeking answer is built in our system. All that it needs is, first, you need to identify a guide who, with whom your wavelengths match. That's important. Mm -hmm. With whom your questions match. See, it, like, I went to a wrong end in some ways when I, when I did for PSG because uh, the, the person was not trained in uh, protozoan and so on. But I went to a right guide because I had a question which that guide could answer. Mm -hmm. So this has to be decided that right. whether the guide can guide, supervise you in an area that you want to work on mm -hmm. and whether your wavelengths match. And but But that's one part. The more important part on the person's Personal aspect of the research, it needs perseverance, patience, continuous reading and learning. See, so that, that is something I must emphasize because in today's generation, wider reading has become very rare. Even uh, classroom teaching, nobody reads textbooks now, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Textbooks are very rarely read in classroom or rarely taught in classroom. We take up some paper and discuss and we say, we have taught this topic. If I want to teach gene regulation, I take some paper in epigenetics and discuss it and 
if we, uh, gene regression talk. Now, this is not the right thing. I think there's a problem in the way we are teaching. So when, when a new student comes to my lab, I say, read books first. Take one year time, read the subject, define your question. But then a, a research student, everywhere this may not happen. They, they may want it, they may be required to get into research right away. But it's in the interest of the student himself or herself to prepare one song. We can mm -hmm. always blame the system, but ultimately we are the loser. The person is the loser. And therefore one has to work on one's own, agree that the systems have problems, but then what we can to do to mitigate those problems is important. And that's where wider reading, understanding the subject, understanding the question, understanding the technique. A typical thing that's happening now is most equipments are very sophisticated, automatic. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to do it. Like uh, I, I take the example of confocal microscope. Everybody wants to use confocal microscope. You give your thing to a technician and technician gives you some images. I don't think that's going, going in the good way. The person who is wanting to use must understand principle. And then only you can understand uh, the limitations of the study, where you can improve your results and troubleshooting. If something goes wrong, if I don't know the technique, the principles of the technique, I cannot troubleshoot. Mm -hmm. So that also must be learned. And of course, there can be many, many more things, but these are some <laughs> basic things that I think should happen. Great advice. Thank you so much, sir. Um, so uh, we have a question and answer session, and uh, there are some questions that uh, the viewers have asked. Um, so I've listed a few of those. Um, so we can start with the question and answers. Right. Yeah. Maybe okay, you can so, speak out the questions and then I can answer. I will speak out the question. Yeah. Okay. So the first question is, uh, how do we identify predatory or bogus journals? Well, that's what I said is very difficult. There's no one single definition. Mm -hmm. UGC has tried its best and gone, created more mess. Now, of course, <laughs> there's a care system, which is slightly better, but still nobody can guarantee that a journal which is included or excluded is good or bad or something. But then there are certain general features. An important feature is we must visit the website of the journal, find out if a geographical address is given. And whether the people who are listed as the editor or viewers, do they have any institutional email ID, institutional mm -hmm. address? If they don't, if there's only Gmail, there's a problem. If their email ID is on Gmail, anybody can create any ID. And, and so that's one part that we can look at it what kind of uh, policy that they have given there, what is the peer review system, and whether there's an evidence of peer review, mm -hmm. and what are the charges that they are charged, what kind of papers have been published. This is something that we must do. You see, when we go to, uh, uh, the, uh, to admit our child in a school or college, parents look at the, right? Same thing we need to do. When we want to publish in general, we need to know what that journal is. And today, fortunately, because most journals are online, there's a better way to knowing it. When they're mm -hmm. all hard, hard, hard copies and they're only published, we couldn't have known them unless I see the journal. But being online, they can look at these uh, ways, quality of paper that are published, the time taken, how much money is being charged, and that if that money is negotiable, mm -hmm. if they don't define the money amount itself, and whether the, the uh, journal is very recent. If it's post 2008 or 10, I would, I would be more careful. Because that was the time when the journal started. If it has been being published for 20 years, I'm a little more uh, uh, sure that it's not a kind of, although it, it, that doesn't guarantee quality. But you know, these are things that we can, the criteria that we can look at and design whether the journal is worth considering or not worth considering. All right. Uh, the next question is, uh, should we submit our manuscripts in a journal that is not UGC listed, but is peer reviewed? Yes. You see, this is a question that is a, an important, very uh, peer reviewed, you must be clear about. What, what uh, I, I checked this with UGC, care that what is the current guideline? That if somebody has a paper which is not listed in the UGC, then is that publication counted or not? I was told by UGC that now UGC has given this uh, freedom to the to an academic institution, to university, to define what journals it will consider. 
Now, unfortunately, we tend to go on the wrong side. We include Bogart journals as valid journals. This is our serious problem. But then if that given university has considered that journal as acceptable, it's okay. But the I, I can't say that UGC list is the ultimate or the best list. No, it is not. It has its own limitations. And the more problematic happens, of course, in science, we can always take whether these are indexed or not indexed and so on and so forth. But in discipline like languages and uh, philosophy and uh, there, it's more difficult, more gray areas. But so there, the given institution, the academic community itself has to decide how quality we want to maintain, how good quality we want to maintain. And same thing applies in science. I, I mean, I hope our researchers do not get worried that they must publish a paper in two days' time. Then they will have to go to predatory journal. Two days. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know this, 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 this happens. That you have to solve your deadline to submit a thesis uh, on a certain date and you don't have publication and your requirements are there. So you rush and publish something. A way for everything. <laughs> yes, there's a way for everything. So, so we have to find out the better way. Yes. All right. Uh, can a student publish a review article in sole authorship or independently without his supervisor? Well, can publish, but uh, we, we should remember one thing. Most journals, good journals, will accept a review article from an author provided that author has some publication that okay. Many journals have made this condition. Because you see, review writing has become again a kind of uh, whether it's easier, you don't need in a laboratory or something. I don't say that all reviews are bad. They can be very good reviews written by somebody who is not working that area. That mm -hmm. can happen. But for a student to write a review is something to think about, to uh, serious thing about. Does that student have good understanding of the subject? It's not that they cannot have, they can have. But if they have, yes, because they review what has happened when I when I uh, review review manuscript, a common comment that I write often is that a review is not just a compilation of references. Reviewer has to integrate different findings, hmm. give it the perspective, give a, give give up something that might have gone wrong or something that might have been useful. If the student had that capacity, yes, they can. But Without supervisor, supervisor coming or not coming, again, it has a mutual discussion. It should not be without the knowledge of supervisor. Oh, yes. Not that a student is a kind of a bonded mm -hmm. level with supervisor, mm -hmm. but they have a special relationship, intellectual relationship. So supervisor must know what intellectual activities the student is doing and student must know, must, must feel it responsible to inform the supervisor that I'm writing this review. And if yeah. a good supervisor, Things that okay, student has capable will permit it. Or, so, or, or maybe supervisor can also contribute to that thing and then they can be, can be joint authorship. Mm -hmm. um, sir, in case a conflict of interest arises, how and by whom should it be solved? Well, you see, conflict of interest again is a gray area, but there are certain defined legal def definitions that when can con conflict of interest arise? One is, for example, family relations. That okay, I, I shouldn't be reviewing my son's manuscript as, mm -hmm. as a reviewer, or, but as editor, if it comes, to, if I'm an editor of a journal and my son is a, let's say, researcher and submits a manuscript, there I have to make sure I withdraw either as editor, but let's say, if I'm chief editor, I may assign it to someone else, but I cannot say that you cannot publish in this journal because I'm an editor. See, that, that, that will be again wrong. So, <laughs> yeah. so, so, that, so these kind of conflict of interest have to be kind mm -hmm. of resolved with some understanding. But mm -hmm. then there are certain very clear conflict of interest. I can be reviewer of a manuscript of my collaborator, of my own immediate PhD student. If my PhD student has gone 20 years ago, 10 years ago and established himself, yes, and they're independent, they are not collaborators. So, so, you know, these kinds of conflict of interest are defined in many places. And if there's a doubt, one can seek the, from the general what, what they will they consider as conflict of interest. The other conflict of interest from author's point of view is when you are 
funded by a private agency. Mm -hmm. You see, this has become very critical in the recent times, particularly about pharmaceutical industry and drug discoveries and so on, that many pharma industries are funding and they give you funding that, okay, show this drug to be working mm. when you write a paper. Now, there you have to describe whether the funding has influenced your results or what funding you have received, whether that has happened. Or for example, even a government funding, but government funding is, is in mission mode and you're supposed to find certain kinds of results. The, the, these are difficult area to define, but these should be considered. Okay. And especially commercially uh, of interest papers uh, and biomedical uh, research and uh, drug discoveries, this becomes more serious. Mm -hmm. sure. um, the next question is, uh, is it compulsory to use ethics in all types of research? Yes, but ethics is flexible. You see, unfortunately, even our, our mythology says <laughs> anything that is justified can be correct. Okay. But then basic ethics is basic ethics that you do not manipulate data, you do not copy data, you do not do something which is not there. So it, it can't be said that, okay, XYZ is ethics and uh, YZ is not ethics. That's very difficult to say. Mm -hmm. But this is something that uh, one, one has to understand and it has to come from one's own heart. Right. Okay, uh, how can one create awareness about research ethics? Well, the, 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 this is one activity. Yes. <laughs> uh, create right. discussions, mm -hmm. discussion within the group, between groups, and of course, uh, articles that, that are there, the huge number of articles that are on ethics issues. One has to read them, one has to pra practice them. And of course, now there's a classroom uh, the requirement. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way. And that, that's what I said. If they are done ethically, they, they become useful. Okay, uh, if my colleague is in the lab, if my colleagues in the lab are venturing too much into my research activities, even if they do not contribute meaningfully to the work, should such acts be encouraged? Well, venturing is what you see. Uh, what I was my, my feeling is, let's say in my lab, I have five students, each working in a slightly different area, but they must discuss with each other. It's not that they keep things kind of confidential and do not discuss. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they may say, no, no, somebody will steal my ideas and do something. But we must understand research is a collaborative act. And I, 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 as an old person, remember historical things where people say, for example, the, the best example is uh, uh, Thomas and Morgan's Drusofla fly room with great uh, students of his, uh, C.B. Bridges, uh, uh, Muller, and Sturtevan, and Altenberg, mm -hmm. they, they, each of them became a great uh, iconic uh, research in, in, uh, in flight genetics. But nobody knew who gave the idea initially to do an experiment. It was such a free discussion. And I think that's how that fly room could generate whole field of genetics ultimately. And wherever this kind of free discussion happens is where good ideas come out from. See, we, and like in our group, that's what we try to inculcate. Right. Uh, the different faculties working in different areas. You all sit together, listen to a given student. It gives us ideas and gives students multiple ideas. And so keeping into uh, individual pockets is never good. But then whether one should be an author in something or only acknowledge depends on the degree of contribution and, uh, and, and degree of acknowledgement that is required. Mm -hmm. For a PhD thesis, somebody you include in your thesis and do not say that this was done by so-and-so, but include the name in publication, I take it as unethical. So I have one last question. Uh, does the ethical committee take money for clearance of ethics for researchers if he or she is not working in the same institutions? Well, I'm not sure that there is any provision of money, but then an ethical committee has power within a certain domain. Uh, like ethical committee of BHU cannot uh, decide on, eth uh, on some ethical issue in calculating No, it can decide. So somebody outside, unless they have a domain where they're authorized to take on ethical issues, 
But within that domain, I don't think money is involved in it. No. Because if you are doing it for money, yeah. obviously it's unethical. <laughs> and, and same is true. I, I know unethical authorship, this has happened. Uh, because sometimes it has happened that, okay, if you publish in this hyper impacted journal, you get so much of personal cash money. Mm -hmm. And so I invite so and so. Look, I'm going to get one lakh rupees. I'll give you 50,000 rupees. You, you give me your authorship name. It's un completely unethical. That's what we'll call as gifted authorship, unethical. So that brings us to the end of the question and answer round. Is that so, uh, Shubhu? Uh, is there any more questions? No? Okay. So I'll just. So uh, it's over to you then. Thank you so much for uh, conducting this session. I enjoyed it. Oh, it was such a pleasure and uh, since I am uh, working in uh, Bioengine uh, Plant Science Journal, I'm learning so much and this session was really, really something I really needed and uh, it was great, you know, to, to uh, see I so many people and, interact. And, 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 and yes, I enjoyed and one, one for any uh, of the viewers or listeners, they can write to me on my email, any question that they have. All my papers are on my research gate page every paper uh, for, for them to read. If someone, if some answers are not in full text there, they can write to me and I'll send, I'll share the PDF with, with pleasure. Great. Thank you. And uh, today we also try to send few your ethics related uh, publication to all the registered participants. I, I have already collected. And uh, very recently, uh, uh, a list of journals, uh, Published by American Society, ASPV, Plant Biotechnologies, on plant biotech uh, journals. Yeah. So I will also share this list because it's also help us to minimize the bogus yeah. journal or parasite right. journal initially, and uh, just go through their author's instruction is itself a good thing. Those are the very uh, beginning in the researchers, maybe MSc students or PS, PhD first year, second year student. They should go for the author's instruction. It gives us so many informations. Actually, we don't know uh, many technical part also, like where put you the figure, legend, number, or which should, which should be the font using in the figure, man, figure preparation, etc. So it gives us a little bit homework. And once we have the result, we have a concept, we have a, some views we can write, uh, so your webinar talk not only give the younger, everybody benefited from here. And as I uh, observe in the YouTube live chat box, many people are argued uh, in one thing that Indian journal took many times. Someone asked that it took one year to review process. So yes, uh, it, it can happen. And uh, recently, uh, last, last uh, few days back, I... I came up a journal which took four years for the PV, uh, review process. It's an international journal, but took a four year. And different meme related uh, groups are available in social media. And someone put this journal uh, is, a, is a one type of meme that it took four years to review process, complete the review process. But it's happened to journal to journal sometime uh, because most of the reviewer are doing it is a social service, not taking any money for that. And they are try to manage their time with their work. So it's sometime uh, took uh, expected long, uh, much expected uh, longer time than the expectation. Sir, your, your, uh, as we are from the plant science background, but uh, I know your hold in the uh, zoology, your uh, reputation in animal science and uh, uh, RNA uh, science, but your knowledge uh, on ethics, publications is really benefited all of us. We literally enjoyed your every talk, uh, how you meant, uh, how you consider, and obviously we also, uh, as you asked, that younger uh, fellow are need to think about that which come first, the impact factor or the value of the research. So it's a very, uh, very good uh, 
pinpoint our thoughts that we should consider the journal on basis of their scientific involvement and uh, we prefer uh, to find out the well known journal and try to publish our work there because sometimes uh, just reply from a reviewer can improve your journal it's happened to me many times uh, i send it uh, and it uh, reply from the journal first time it hurts that uh, uh, why he or she said to that but uh, definitely when you thought in multiple time that is right uh, he is right on that and uh, try to include these things make more impactful the journals so we are learning uh, as you say the learning is key to improvement so we are uh, try to learn many thing and uh, i hope in future we we call you once again in a in a different aspect anytime i'll be happy as so it's it's very help uh, us to just see someone some figure who believes on it and uh, try to do in that way because uh, sometime we also need uh, some people who actually believes on it and their physical existence in our country or in the world uh, thanks sir if if everything is uh, uh, okay then 13 to 16 november i will be in bhu i try to please contact please you uh, to yeah. visit one hour in your lab to sure. uh, physically uh, talk to you uh, okay sir and, and and i must thank you for arranging such kind of talks this is something you are doing and carry it on uh, th- thanks uh, we we also arrange our talk uh, from a reputed uh, scientist american uh, scientist uh, he is he is a retired person of wheat breeding uh, but uh, he will give us a professional development talk on professional development right. yeah. in, um, yeah. so it's uh, it's a, a, a end of the october so we try to bring some similar type of talk which is either ethics either soft skill either uh, our Uh, related to plants not exactly related to plant science but it's help to more people uh, professionals because uh, our viewers are most of the 28 to 34 uh, range so the 20 to 30 is a mon- most of our viewers are between 20 to 30 so uh, yeah. that's the reason that we need to and what we are doing is free for all and open for all there is nothing related to any money is just uh, uh, it's is bringing a platform for plant scientists or the researchers so one such a good activity thanks thanks sir one second well, thank you and thanks all the participant and uh, just i wanted to include one thing it's not for me it's not ethical can i give you the certificate without that in the webinar without the uh, learning from the webinar many people have come here for the certificate that's why i try to make more more tough to get the certificate if you there if you present in this webinar you will get the certificate uh, that's why the link that's why the password that's why the different alteration and modulation that nobody use this platform certificate collections your because your thousand certificate nothing if you know nothing so it's right. not a not a thing that you collect a thousand certificates is important that you learn something from this platform and it's a continuous platform so maybe one day we have a thousand webinar and you have a thousand certificates so <laughs> what what is the meaning on that but use it suggest our the topic suggest the uh, good speaker so we can bring them invite them invite uh, and discuss the, those topics which benefit for all of all of us so thanks thanks for uh, participating today's uh, event sir it's a grateful thanks shoma help me to carry out lot of fun thank you it was really thank enjoyable you. Thank, thank you sir thank you so thank much you. we learned so much enjoyable. from you today and, and you uh, covered so much grounds and 
um it was it was really 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 uh, you know uh, knowledge knowledge was there and so people and so many appreciations from people and i wish you happy teachers day thank you, thank you so much sir wish you all the all the very best thank you enjoy it's <laughs> a great gift for my teachers sir thanks <laughs> thanks Bye. thank you thank you sir and oh, yeah. everyone i will end this meeting uh, thanks so much for assisting me and i am hope i am hoping that everybody got the password for today's webinar and our next webinar in 17 in this month and to, uh, all the upcoming webinar are available uh, in our website registration are ongoing in bioengine.com so go and register and when you click the registration submission form you will automatically get the link so save the link in your computer and use this link on particular day day of the event there is nothing to worried about the link i am uh, that is the reason why i put these things if you register you have the link there is nothing that i need to send you link is a optional i need to send a link once again by mail but it's not mandatory you already have the link so if you are registered participant you have the link there is nothing uh, what i say you uh, misunderstand being on that uh, it's a automatic reply from google forms so bye bye we will meet once again in our next webinar 17 bye